Hello students, welcome to Show of Search classes. So in today's video, we will solve UGC NET Economics 2014 paper. So today we will solve paper 2. So now I will go to the question. So today we will solve 8 questions from question number 1 until question number 8. So today we will solve 8 questions. If you go through this 8 questions, they are all from microeconomics. So they are all from microeconomics. So today we will start with the first question. So it is question number 1. So in question number 1 it is given. So it is given who distinguished between value you use and value in exchange and gave the famous example of diamonds and water. So who distinguished between value in use and value in exchange and gave the famous example of diamond and water. So now we'll answer this question but before I answer this first I'll write down a couple of things. So for this question we must know the term utility is associated with British philosopher Bentham. So the term utility is associated with the famous philosopher. His name is Jeremy Bentham. So basically, however, he neither neither he nor the economist of the time understood the relationship between value of the goods and utility derived from their consumption. So he and other economists of his time did not understand the value of goods. and utility derived from their consumption. So he did not understand the value of goods or utility derived from their consumption. So, it is Adam Smith, so basically it is Adam Smith distinguished between value in use, he is the person who distinguished between value in use and value in exchange. So, it was Adam Smith who distinguished between value in use and value in exchange and gave the famous example of and gave the famous example of diamonds and waters and give the famous example of diamond and waters. Now diamonds have a high price which is value in exchange. Now diamonds has a high price that is price is the value of exchange but they are unnecessary for life. That is, they are unnecessary for life. That is, they are a low value in use. So, a low value in use. On the other hand, water has a low exchange value. That is, water has a low exchange value 
but necessary for life that is high in use value. So this is how with this example of diamond and water Adams could distinguish between the exchange value and the use value. So now we'll get back to the question again. So in the question it was given who distinguished between the value in use and the value in exchange and gave the famous example of diamond and water it would be option A that is Adam Smith so it would be option A that is Adam Smith so out of these four options the right answer is option A so for question number one the right answer is option A so now we'll go to the next question that is question number two so in question number two it is given in an economy of two individuals A and B and two commodities X and Y general equilibrium of production and exchange occurs when four options are given that is in an economy of two individuals A and B and two commodities X and Y general equilibrium of production and exchange occurs when so there are four options given so now we have to figure out which one is the right answer So for question number two, first we need to understand what is general equilibrium of exchange. So what is general equilibrium of exchange? So what is general equilibrium of exchange? The condition when marginal rate of substitution, the condition when marginal rate of substitution in consumption for two commodities is same for both individuals for two commodities say x and y is same for two individuals say person a and person b so what is the general equilibrium of exchange that is the condition when marginal rate of substitution that is mrs in consumption for two commodities x and y is same for both individuals that is person A and B this is the first condition that is general equilibrium of exchange now we will write down general equilibrium of production so this is the general equilibrium of exchange so in general equilibrium of production we know the condition when marginal rate of technical substitution so which is marginal rate of technical substitution is of one factor for another factor say for one factor say labor is equals to marginal rate of substitution for another factor is same for product production of L2K and K2L both are same for production of A and B to other commodities we say that there is equilibrium general equilibrium in production so we have got MRS XY equals to MRS XY for A and B we have found MRS LK and MRS KL for both commodities X and Y so now I'll write down the general equilibrium of production and exchange so we'll combine these two and we'll write down general equilibrium for production and exchange so now i'll write down the general equilibrium for production and exchange so the general equilibrium production and exchange condition is marginal rate of transformation between two commodities so marginal rate of transformation that is MRTS between two commodities X and Y is equals to the marginal rate of substitution is equals to marginal rate of substitution consumption between two commodities for each individual. So the equilibrium condition is MRTS XY equals to MRS equals to XY. So initially we have write, written down the general equilibrium for exchange which is MRS between two consumers are same then we have written down MRTS between two commodities is same which is general equilibrium for production 
Now when we combine this together, we get the general e equilibrium for production and exchange which is MRTS x comma y is equals to MRS x comma y. So thank you for watching this video. If you have any query or doubt, you can simply WhatsApp me on this number which is 9836-793076. So now we'll go to the next question which is question number 3. So for question number 2, we have found the right answer to be this that is option D where MRT XY is equals to MRS A MRS B. So we have found the right answer for question 2 which is option D. Now we'll go to next question which is question number 3. Again I am repeating in today's lecture we are basically solving the microeconomics question from paper 2. So today we are solving paper 2 from UGC NET 2014 it is June exam so now we'll go to question number 3 so in question number 3 it is asked when the income effect becomes so stronger than substitution effect the labor supply curve will be four options are given bend backward negatively slope slope positively and slope upward so we have to find out the right answer when income effect becomes stronger than substitution effect, the labor supply curve will be. So first we need to understand what is income effect and what is substitution effect. So for this first we have to write down the labor supply curve in terms of their income which is wage and the supply of labor. So I'll take another page. So here question number three. So what is income effect and what is substitution effect first we need to understand this so for this what we have to do is have to write down have to draw the labor supply curve so here we measure wage and here we measure labor supply now we know laborers basically face trade-off between two things one is labor another is leisure so they get utility from leisure and they also get utility from labor in terms of wage so the utility that they get by providing labor is wage but basically labor is nothing but this utility because they are giving up on utility which they derive from leisure by providing labor so leisure is utility and labor is this utility but uh, by providing labor they earn wage so now what is income effect and what is substitution effect now say for an example wage is here and the labor is here now say for an example if wage increases what happens basically when wage increases now laborers have more wage so they tend to prefer leisure which gives them utility over labor so when wage increases there are two effects one is income effect so what is income effect? so when wage increases due to income effect laborers substitute leisure they prefer leisure over labor because their income has increased on the other hand there is another effect which is substitution effect so sub due to substitution effect what happens now laborers as wage has increased they would their preference for labor has increased so they will increase labor so what we have to take from this to understanding is that due to income effect leisure increases and labor falls due to substitution effect labor leisure falls and labor increases so in the question it is given the income effect becomes stronger than substitution effect so when income effect is stronger than substitution effect that is labor falls so the right answer would be option c that is it will be 
backward bending so I will draw a backward bending curve we need not draw this so it will be a backward bending curve so it will be backward bending like this so this will be the labor supply curve now what does this curve basically illustrates it says when income effect is stronger than substitution effect that is the laborers will prefer leisure over labor as income increases and this is stronger than this effects where leisure falls and labor increases so we would conclude that due to income effect when wage increases as this is stronger than this the labor will fall and leisure will increase so now if the initial wage was here say here this was y w naught this is w l naught now wage increases means say wage increases from here to here now as you can see as wage increase the labor falls because income effect due to which the labor falls and leisure increases is stronger than substitution effect so as wage increases now labor starts to pay for leisure over labor so the labor falls from it not to l1 so we would conclude that this is the right answer that is the labor supply curve will be backward bending so for question number three the labor supply curve will be backward bending so now we'll go to question number three so question in question number three the right answer would be option c that is it will be backward bending so so far we have solved three question now we'll solve other question from the macroeconomic part of this paper for paper two now we'll go to the next question which is question number four so in question number four it is given the concept of supply curve is meaningless for monopolist this is the assumption now and the reason is given as monopolist are price setters it does not make reuse to ask what output they will produce at various prices so whether these two are right or wrong we have to figure out but before this first we need to understand the concept of supply curve in terms of monopolist for this we'll take another page so i'll write down things which are needed that is under monopoly So under monopoly, shape of different cost curve is exactly like that under perfect competition. So under monopoly, shape of different cost curves is exactly like that. under perfect competition now fixed cost curve that is fc is parallel to ox axis xc is parallel to ox axis say fc is parallel to ox axis and average fixed cost if fc is rectangular hyperbola and afc is rectangular hyperbola which looks like this this is nothing but afc and average variable cost and marginal cost curve an average cost curve and AVC, AC and MC, they are all U-shaped. They are all U-shaped. So they are like this. Now, now, whereas marginal cost curve is supply curve of firm under perfect competition. So now marginal cost curve, this marginal cost curve is basically 
supply curve under perfect competition and marginal cost is equals to price in long run under com perfect competition. So under perfect competition we know MC is equals to AR which is price. So this is for perfect competition. Now but under monopoly so now so now under monopoly under monopoly we know supply curve is not marginal cost curve that is under monopoly marginal cost curve is not the supply curve and price which is AR is higher than marginal cost and price is higher than marginal cost. So it may be also be noted that a monopolist is not obliged to sell a given amount of commodity at a given price. Now if he fixes the price then how much quantity he will have to supply at that price will be left to the decision of the buyers. If buyer demands more he will have to supply more. If buyer demands less he will have to supply less. According to accordingly under monopoly the concept of supply curve becomes meaningless. So we have to draw a diagram for monopoly. Sorry for the technical difficulty. So now we will simply draw what it says basically. See this is AR, this is MR, this is MC curve. As you can see price lies, as you can see price line lies above the MC which is this so this condition holds and the second understanding is that how much quantity he will have to supply so how much quantity he will have to supply will be left to left to the decision of the buyers will be left to the decision of the buyers that how much they are demanding they will supply more so in this way the concept of supply curve under monopoly becomes meaningless so there are two points first is unlike perfect competition here price which is AR lies above MC and second is like the how much supply it he will produce at different price it depends on the demand how much demand it has and supply and it depends on the decision of the suppliers so now we'll go to question number four so for question number four there are four options given the concept of supply curve is meaningless for monopolist yes we have seen it is true so we are left with both a and r are correct a is correct r is not correct both a r and r are correct so r is correct so these three options we are left with because it says a is not a is incorrect which cannot be true because we know the concept of supply curve is meaningless for the monopolist. Now we will come to the reason. So in reason it is given monopolist are price setters. That is it does not make reuse to ask what output they will produce at various prices. So monopolist are price setters. It does not make reuse to ask what output they will produce. So we know basically supply curve shows that the relationship between price and quantity now when price increases how much quantity increase it does not depends on the market rather it depends on the decision of the monopolist so monopolist are the price setters unlike perfect competitors and it does not make reuse to ask what output they will produce at various prices so this is also right so in this way we can say that the 
right answer is both a and r are correct and r is the correct explanation of a so we would conclude for question number four the right answer is option a so for question number four the right answer is option a now we'll go to the next question which is question number five so in question number five it is given predatory pricing policy is designed to four options are given so for this first we need to understand what is predatory pricing so for this i'll take another page so now we we'll come to question number five so first we need to understand what is predatory pricing so predatory pricing is basically occurs where a dominant enterprise charges low prices over a long enough period of time it happens when a dominant enterprise charges low prices over a long enough period so charges low price for long enough period of time so as to derive a competitor from the market so as to derive a competitor from the market or deter others or deter others from entering the market and then raises prices to recoup its losses so what is is given the predatory pricing is a dominant enterprise charges low price charges low price over a long enough period of time so as to derive a competitor from the market so that is drive out a competitor from the market or deter others from entering the market and then raises price and then after that he raises price to recoup its losses so this is known as predatory pricing now greater the diversification of the activities of the enterprise in terms of product and markets the greater the its financial resources the greater is the ability to engage in predatory behavior so greater the sorry so we have to write in the greater greater the diversification of the activities of the enterprise in terms of products and markets greater its financial resources the greater is its ability to engage in predatory behavior so 
what we have found here that is the greater the diversification of the activities of the enterprise in terms of products and markets and so and greater its financial resources the greater is its ability to engage in predatory be benefits so what we have found that is predatory pricing is basically a dominant enterprise ch charges low price over a long enough period of time so as to drive out the competitor from the market or to deter others from from entering the market and then raises prices to recoup its losses so for question number five we have to find out the right answer now i'll go back to the question again so in question it is given predatory pricing is designed to drive competitors out of business maximize profit engage entrance into market encourage entrance into market and attain least cost output so we know predatory pricing is nothing but goes with the option a that is it is designed to drive competitors out of the business so for question number five the right answer is option a so so far we have solved five question so we are still to do three more questions so now i'll go to question number six so now we'll go to question number six so in question number six it is given match items in list one with items in list two and select the correct answer from the code given below so there are four options given first i want you to go through the question once and see if you can r correctly answer it then i'll go to the answer see if you can correctly answer it so i hope you guys have gone through the question now i'll come to the question again so in this question it is given the screening hypothesis so the screening hypothesis is given by whom so we know the screening hypothesis is given by paul w miller and paul a volker so it is given by paul w miller and paul w paul a volker so the screening hypothesis is given by paul w miller and paul w volker so so screening hypothesis is given by miller and volker now we'll come to job market signaling so job market signaling is given by a job market signaling is given by we know it is spencer so the job market signaling is given by spencer so the job market signal is is given by spencer now i'll come to the next which is the problem of moral hazard in the case of medical insurance the problem of moral hazard in case of medical insurance is given by we know kj arrow so the concept of moral hazard in case of medical insurance is given by kj arrow and finally so we are left with the last one that is the market for lemons is given by akerlof that is george a akerlof so for question number for op a list a the right answer is 4 so for a the right answer is 4 for b so for a that is signaling hypothesis is given by paul w miller and paul a volker and job market signaling is given by spencer so that is for b the right answer is three now the problem of moral hazard in case of medical insurance is given by arrow so for question number c right answer is two and the market for lemons is given by acker loff so market for lemons, which is for d the right answer is a so now if you go by the options it seems that option c that is four three two one so this is the right answer so for question number six the right answer is option c so for question number six the right answer is option c now we'll go to the other two questions from this paper that is question So now we'll go 
to the other question from the paper. There is question number 7 and 8. Now we will go to question number 7. So in question number 7 it is given that is an industry whose long run supply curve is horizontal. So an industry whose long run supply curve is horizontal is called constant cost industry, increasing cost industry, decreasing cost industry and efficient industry. For this we know when the whose long run supply curve is horizontal we know it nothing but constant cost industry. So for industry whose supply curve is horizontal we call it constant cost industry. For question number 7 right answer is option A. So now we have come to the last question of this video. So we have come to the last question for this video that is question number 8. So in question number 8 it is given the practice of charging each consumer the reservation price is called peak load pricing intertemporal price discrimination first degree discrimination and third degree discrimination so we have to figure out which one is the right answer that is the pra practice of charging consumer the reservation price is called which of the following so first i will explain what is basically reservation price and what is price discrimination so i'll insert another page so now we'll be dealing with question number eight so in question number eight first we need to understand what is first degree price discrimination so there were options